Joining us right now via Zoom chat is uh, scripture scholar, professor at Augustine Institute, uh, Dr. Michael Barber. He's got a brand new book out called The True Meaning of Christmas, The Birth of Jesus and the Origins of the Season, published by Ignatius Press. Uh, good morning to you, Dr. Barber. It's great to be with you, Joe. Thanks so much. Praise be to God. It's good to see you again. It's been a very long time since I've had the chance to talk to you, uh, so I'm glad to do so again. And what a great occasion to do this at the uh, one of the greatest seasons in the liturgical calendar, that of the Christmas season. Yes, uh, St. John Chrysostom and uh, the early church called it the chief and mother of all holy days. I love that. The chief and mother of all holy days. That's so, that's so <laughs> strong. Praise be to God. Uh, now, this, in particular, this book, I think, is going to be fascinating because as I've, I haven't read the book yet, but in listening to some of your commentary on the book and your conversations with others about it, I, I find that there's probably going to be some very fascinating points in this. For instance, your talk on the dating of Christmas, the Christmas tree traditions and things like that uh, are, are, are very fascinating. But right out of the gate, what was the most fascinating thing that you learned during your process of writing this book? Well, you know, I'm a Bible scholar, so what I w wanted to do was write a book that would be accessible for anyone, right? So we did get the renowned theologian and uh, Christian scholar John Cavadini to write a forward for the book, but I really wanted to help write a book that, you know, would answer just people's general questions. Why is Jesus born in a manger? Why does it say there's no room in the inn? Is there some kind of like Hotel Bethlehem with a like no yeah. vacancy sign in it? Why is it so important that the mother of the Messiah is a virgin? What does round yon virgin mean anyway, right? Why is it significant that we have shepherds in the field? What were shepherds, you know, considered like it? What, what, what was their role in the Christmas story, what were they were what was their role in first century Jewish world? Who are the magi? Why do we associate with them with the three kings? They're never called kings in the story. Uh, why do they come on camels? Uh, what is this <laughs> mysterious Christmas star? Is it like Jupiter aligning with Mars in the age of Aquarius or you know, something like that? Well, what's going on there? Um, but I gotta tell you, so I knew a lot of that going into this because again, I'm a scripture scholar, I teach this stuff. Uh, so, you know, it's fun for me. Every chapter, I take the words of a familiar Christmas song. So every every chapter starts with the words of a Christmas song. And then we sort of start from there and unpack the meaning of various aspects of the Christmas story. But I will say, I really wanted to include in this book a treatment on some of the customs that we have associated with Christmas, the history of the development of the Christmas celebration. And I wanted to look at how did December 25th become Christmas? That was something that was very interesting to me. And I, I gotta be honest with you, uh, I didn't know as much as I thought I did about this topic. And really that was par for the course. I found in writing the book that a lot of the things that are said about the Christmas story, mm. a lot of the things that are said about the origins of our Christmas customs are actually not true. And that if you look at serious scholarly sources, you'll, you'll find information that uh, will surprise you. And that was especially the case for me uh, with looking at how December 25th became Christmas. And so that chapter took me probably more time than all the other chapters to write included, you know, um, um, uh, all the other chapters together uh, were less time than that one chapter, chapter 11, where I went through a lot of, you know, peer reviewed academic journals and academic monographs to kind of get to the, get to the the real story. And, and so that was a lot of fun for me. And on that talk, topic in particular, uh, how deep did you dive or count upon, is maybe a better way to phrase it, how much did you count upon the witness of the earliest Christians? Yeah, so the, the chapter goes very deeply into the witness of the earliest Christians. And I look at, you know, how, how did the early Christians come to decide that they should celebrate Jesus' birth on December 25th? Because one thing that you see very clearly is that there was an agreement about when Jesus was born in the early church, right? The earliest Christians in Bethlehem had a very, uh, very clear sense of where Jesus was born, they had a very clear tradition of where Jesus was born, and they they end up building a church there, the Church of Nativity. You can go there to this day. It's a beautiful place. 
been there before. Um, but they but they didn't all agree on where Jesus was born. In fact, no one in the first, say, 200 years says Jesus is born on December 25th. Mm. There are all kinds of other dates that are floating around. Um, so it's a really interesting story to look at. And uh, I had a lot of fun explaining it. It's, it's a very... It's a very involved story. I hope people will read the book and, uh, and and see what we have there. Many people would argue, people who are detractors usually of Christianity in general, would say, well, you're just hijacking winter solstice and, and uh, you know, pre-Christian rituals. What would you say to that? Right. So there is a, a, a narrative out there that, uh, well, Jesus didn't really exist. Jesus is just another spin on ancient pagan mythology. You'll see this out there all the time. One thing that they'll say, for example, is that the god Mithras was born on December 25th, and Jesus is born on December 25th. Jesus is just another Mithras. Well, the reality is there are no ancient sources that tell us that Mithras was born on December 25th. Sometimes they'll say there was a sun god known as Sol Invictus. Soul meaning sun, Invictus meaning unconquerable. And they'll say, oh, well, there was a feast to this pagan sun god on December 25th, and the Christians just copied them. But here's what's interesting. The earliest source that tells us that there was a pagan pa uh, festival to the sun god on December 25th is actually found in the 4th century, in the mm. 300s. And it happens to be found in the same work that is the earliest indisputed reference to Christians celebrating Jesus' birth on December 25th. So we don't have any documentation that proves that the pagans were celebrating it first on December 25th. In fact, it may very well be that Christians were already celebrating Jesus' birth on December 25th, and pagans were concerned with the rise of Christianity and decided they, need, they needed a festival on that date. So it's not really clear as people will often make it out to be. Although the winter solstice is an important backdrop for, for understanding how Christmas gets celebrated. December 25th used to be the winter solstice. So the winter solstice is the day that sunlight begins to grow. And it was a day of great cosmic significance to the ancient world. And what the Christians wanted to do was say, no, Christ is the true sun. In the book of Malachi chapter 4, there's a, a, a verse that talks about how the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness will rise. And early Christians saw that as a reference to Christ. And so what they wanted to say was this day that had great cosmic significance ultimately has its meaning, not in some pagan mythology, but in Christ. He is the true meaning of the world. And so uh, that becomes an important backdrop to the way Christmas gets celebrated on that date. But there's a lot more to it. You'll have to read the whole book <laughs> to get all the details. Yeah, Dr. Barber, um, they say that about Easter too, you know, pagans will say, or they say that Easter is named after the pagan goddess Ishtar. And, and then it doesn't really, doesn't really add up when you look into, no. you know, the translation of the word Easter, et cetera, et cetera. So no, there's there are always... all kinds of things like this. So uh, exactly. I, I interact, I have a chapter on what's called Jesus mythicism, right? That's the idea that Jesus is just another version of ancient pagan mythology. And, you know, people will say things like, <laughs> this, this one really cracks me up, that gospel uh, ultimately has the sense of a spell, you know, that there's some magical connotation of the word gospel. That's absurd. It comes from a Greek word euangelion, which means good news. It has nothing to do with <laughs> magic or ritual or sorcery. Like the music gospel. You know, you can't, yeah, you can't prevent people from making stuff up. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. Dr. Michael Barber is our guest. His book is The True Meaning of Christmas, The Birth of Jesus, and the Origins of the Season, which is published by Ignatius Press, which you can find linked up at Ignatius.com. I encourage you to, to pick up a copy, even if uh, you are you know, well into the Christmas season. By the time you realize this, you might still want to get a copy, because this is a great resource to hand to other people. And uh, what an opportunity all year long to, uh, to continue to plant the seeds 
for truth and reason and for defense of, uh, of the, one of the greatest feasts in our calendar. Speaking of which, uh, let me just uh, pause a little bit to talk about Advent, Dr. Barber. Um, I've, I've heard you talk about this, I think, with Dr. Tim Gray just the other day about this. Um, Christmas season, at the time of this broadcast, is, is right around the corner, but not yet. How important is it for us to, to really celebrate and focus on the season of Advent, and how do we do that without jeopardizing Advent for Christmas? Right. Well, I do think that the best way to prepare for Christ's coming, that's what Advent is really all about, right? It's preparing us for the coming of Christ, ultimately his coming at the end of time. But I think maybe the best way to do that is to meditate on his first coming. And so I really believe that the best way to prepare uh, for Christmas is to think about the Christmas story, to think about what happened when Jesus was born. And what, one of the things I like to highlight is uh, something that the early church recognized, and that is, you know, Jesus is born and laid in a manger. What is that manger? Well, the word there is fatne in Greek. It refers to a feeding trough. Jesus is put where the food goes, right? That's really interesting. Of course, it highlights the humility of God. God loves us so much that he's willing to empty himself. Paul talks about this in Philippians 2, how Christ emptied himself in humility and took the form of a slave, even dying on a cross, right? The scandalous death of a cross. And so what Christ does on the cross is prefigured in his birth, because already he's showing us his humility. And Origen, the great early Christian writer, talks about how truly marvelous, I mean that in the sense of we would marvel at this, that the God of the cosmos wouldn't just become man, but would take on the vulnerability of an infant. Joe, I, I know I'm a father, you know, I, you know what it's like to have small children, right? Infants don't make noble sounds. <laughs> they make in, undignified sounds. Mm. And the thing that God loves us so much that he would be willing not just to become man, but to become an infant just speaks volumes about the lengths to which God will go to save us. But then we also see he's put where the food goes. And that prefigures another important mystery, and that is the mystery of the Eucharist. Uh, St. Jerome, the great early church father, pointed out that Jesus is born in Bethlehem. Beth means house. Lehem means bread in Hebrew. Jesus is born in the house of bread. And so in the Christmas story, we have a foreshadowing of the Eucharist. The best way to prepare for Christ coming at the end of time is to greet him when he comes to us as the bread from heaven in the Eucharist. If we prepare to receive him at Mass, we will be prepared to receive him, not just at Christmas time, but on the last day. So, you know, some people say, well, you know, you shouldn't put up a Christmas tree before December 25th. Don't put any Christmas songs on before December 25th. Amen. I'm not, I'm not so sure about that. I'm not so sure about that. I, I think the best way to prepare for Christ's coming is to really reflect on that mystery. Of course, in the liturgy, we don't celebrate the, the liturgical season of Christmas until December you know, 24th, really, Christmas Eve. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I always wear purple you know, uh, throughout the day. It doesn't mean that because we're in Advent, we can't wear green or red. Uh, and, and just because it's Christmas doesn't mean that I should always be wearing green green or red either, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, so, so I think that we have to sort of recognize that, yes, we have these distinct liturgical seasons of the church, but we should also recognize that God wants us to prepare for his coming by meditating on that story of his birth and preparing to receive him at Mass. And every Mass, make no mistake about it, is a little Christmas, because the same Lord who came to us as bread from heaven comes to us in the liturgy. And that's why we sing every Sunday, glory to God in the highest. That's the song the angels sang to the shepherds in the field, glory to God in the highest. When heaven touched down to earth, 
the angels sang glory to God in the highest. And when heaven touches down to earth in the liturgy, the church teaches us to sing the same words because there we recognize the coming of the same Savior. You know, I was I I hate to bring up more Advent stuff, even though because we're this is supposed to be about Christmas. But I was thinking about as you're saying this, I was thinking about the one of my favorite times of the year are the seven days leading up to Christmas because we mm. got start saying singing the O antiphons. And I know oh, this sure. is technically a liturgical question, but I mean all of these O antiphons are referring back to Isaiah, to the Psalms, right. and to these ideas. Could you comment on the the history of the or the the context and the content of the O antiphons that are being sung on the days leading up to the Christmas celebration? Right. Well the key thing we see is the 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 a use of biblical prophecy in reference to Christ's birth. Christ is coming to fulfill the words of, for example, the prophet Isaiah. A prophet Isaiah tells us, for example, about a child who will be born who will be called Emmanuel. Now, if you read that prophecy in the original context of Isaiah, we see it's probably referring to King Hezekiah, right, who is a Davidic king through whom the Davidic kingdom is, is saved. But of course, that that salvation is not permanent, anything but. Now, uh, Hezekiah does not live up to the great prophecies that Isaiah announces. And so ancient Jews recognized that those prophecies had a fuller meaning, a meaning that would only be fulfilled in the coming of the Messiah. And so what we see in the liturgy is the way Christ is coming to fulfill the scriptures. Again, if you want to find yourself home at Christmas, if you want to be home at Christmas, there's that beautiful song, I'll be home at Christmas, if only in my dreams. If we, if we want to be home at Christmas, we have to recognize that Christmas's home is in the story of the Bible. And once we recognize that story is being fulfilled in Christ, we too can enter into that same story and we won't be let down. We won't be disappointed because Christ is faithful and he will bring us reconciliation, not just with people that we love here in this life, but with the God of heaven, with the angels, with the saints, and bring us into that heavenly home that he's prepared for us. Dr. Michael Barber is our guest. The True Meaning of Christmas, The Birth of Jesus, and the Origins of the Season is the book. Ignatius.com is the website where you can pick up a copy. I'm sure you can get it elsewhere as well, but Ignatius Press publishes it, and you should check them out, Ignatius.com. Why did you start, Dr. Barber, every chapter with A Christmas Carol? Oh, first of all, because I love I love the music of the season. It's so beautiful. Uh, and, and I think it's important to recognize how, you know, there are silly Christmas songs. Grandma got ran over by a reindeer. Uh, yeah. But there are ones that are more enduring, ones that 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 seem to touch our hearts every year. Again, uh, so many of these songs talk about dreaming. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas, like the ones I used to know, or I'll be home if only in my dreams. So many of these songs talk about things that are near and dear to our heart. And so what I wanted to do was start with something that would be familiar to people and show how the biblical story is rooted in these in these yearnings. So the first major chapter of the book is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. What is that song all about? Well, ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile. Israel has been taken away in captivity because of sin. Israel longs to return from exile. Isn't that what so many people experience at the Christmas season? They think about Christmas past. They think about the glories of Christmas long ago, as Andy Williams puts it in his song, It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year. We think back to the golden days of yore, right? As you think about that song, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, right? Here we are as in the olden days, happy golden days of yore. Faithful friends gather near to us. Uh, once more, um, we we long for those Christmases that we remember, and so often, Christmas present never lives up to Christmas past. Why? Well, because we've associated Christmas with being with loved ones, and that that song I love that song. Have yourself a very ma merry Christmas. Uh, have yourself a merry little Christmas, because it it points out that the golden days of your are the ones we're living in right now. Right, gather near to us once more. We don't know how many more times we'll gather with the family members that we have. Life, life passes by in a flash. Every parent has children that they 
lift up, that they carry in their arms. Every parent put down their child for the last time. Every parent, there was a moment where every parent held their baby and for the last time put that baby down. And that moment passes by unceremoniously. We don't even realize when it happened. That's the last time I held my son, Michael or Matthew or whatever. Now Michael's 13 for me, right? Um, <laughs> it, life passes by so quickly and, and, and we don't even... We, we can't grab it. Augustine talks about how, you know, it's, it's like water. We're trying to hold on to it. It's just, it, it's, it sifts through our hand. It, it sifts through our fingers. And, it, and, and so people often feel like Christmas is a letdown. They listen to these songs. What I wanted to do was, was help people think about these songs in light of the biblical story and see how the hopes and the yearnings that, we associate with them are ultimately fulfilled when we recognize the homecoming that we have in the story of Christ's birth, that Christ invi is inviting us into the family of the Father. And if we recognize that that's really at the heart of the Christmas story, and we recognize that Christ has come as Savior, then we can never be let down. We can never imagine that reconciliation is impossible. I mean, think about that silly movie, Home Alone, that, you know, it's it kind of got Christmas in the background. The end of the story is this scene of this reconciliation of this father with his estranged child, right? His son who's been gr who's grown up and his grandchildren. People want to be reconciled at Christmas. And I think so many people believe it's not possible because our sin has fractured our relationships, have separated us. But the grace of the Savior is able to overcome all of that brokenness and bring us the joy that we long for. Dr. Barber, I have a question. Sure. Um, you know, you're talking about the lead up to Christmas. And you kind of just discussed, you know, how it just kind of comes unceremoniously. Um, well, after Christmas Day, there's 50 days of Christmas in the liturgical season. Uh, how how would you uh, suggest people celebrate or continue to celebrate Christmas in those 50 days in that? Yeah, it's funny. You know, there. So you know, the book is called "The True Meaning of Christmas," and of course that raises the question, are there false meanings of Christmas? Uh, well, actually there are. And a lot of the things people have heard about Christmas is actually, as I show in the book, not actually true. And some of these things are, are not all that helpful. Um, some people have heard, you know, that the 12 days of Christmas, you've heard that song. It's got that, you know, annoying repetition and a partridge in a pear tree. Right. Um, but it, some people have heard that song is like an encoded song for Christians and person. That's nonsense. That's not true. And there's always internet sites that are going to perpetrate this, these, you know, these these legends on people. Real scholars point out that this is, has no basis in fact. But one thing that's really helpful about that song is that it helps people remember it isn't just a day. Christmas isn't just a day. It is a season. And I think the best thing we can do is not just try to analyze that Christmas song, you know, Lords of Leapin, Lords of Leapin. What does that mean? Now let's look at the, <laughs> let's look at the liturgical calendar itself and really focus on the meaning there. A lot of people don't understand that the season, that the, the, the feasts there are very carefully arranged. So what's the day after Christmas? The Feast of St. Stephen, right? You know, the song, Good King Wenceslas went out on the Feast of Stephen, right? Well, why is that important? Why do we celebrate the first martyr on the day after Christmas. And then the next day is what? The Feast of John the Apostle. And the day after that is the Feast of the Holy Innocents. You know, Christians came to understand that these three feasts were really important and part of the Christmas season. Why? Well, Christians understood that the death of the martyrs marked their birthday, right? So a martyr's death is his birthday into heaven. And so we celebrate the birthday of Christ, but then we recognize that it's not biological birth that is most important. What's really important is birth into eternal life. And so we look at the Feast of St. Stephen on the Feast of December 26. But see, Stephen represents the martyrs, those who give their life freely to Christ. The next day we celebrate the Feast of John the Apostle. Why is that? Well, there's a strand of tradition that says that John couldn't be killed, that they tried to martyr John. They tried to, for example, have him drink poison and he wouldn't die. So 
on the feast of the 27th, we remember those who would give their life as a martyr, but died of some other natural, you know, some other, some other cause, right? So we have those who give their lives as martyrs willingly, 26. We have St. John representing those who would give their life as a martyr, but die of some other purpose. And then on the next day, we celebrate the Feast of the Holy Innocents, who die in Christ without realizing it, right? And so the church recognizes they th that also represents a group of people, right? Who die for Christ, but they don't really realize that they're dying for Christ yet. So, so in the church's liturgy, we recognize, and, and this is long-standing Christian tradition, that these three feasts are very important in the Christmas season. And I think that that's something that's lost on a lot of people. I didn't really understand that this was an established Christmas tradition until I researched the book, right? So December 26th, December 27th, Feast of Stephen, the Feast of St. John the Apostle, then the Feast of Holy Innocence. Of course, on January 1st, we, we celebrate the Feast of Mary as the Mother of God. All of these feasts are very important, and the more we study them, the better we understand them. I think the better we can enter into that Christmas season as it's meant to be celebrated. Dr. Michael Barber is our guest. The True Meaning of Christmas is the book, and I encourage you to check it out at Ignatius.com. I want to talk about a couple of things. We have just under 10 minutes left with Dr. Barber here. Um, number one, there was, I've heard you talk about this in other interviews about uh, no room at the end, and you yeah. link back to the upper room. Um, yes. I'd love for you to share that with us, but more, but very specifically, it got me curious in listening to you talk about that, having not had the benefit of re reading your book yet. Uh, is there a connection here specifically, literally, to the upper room? Was there an intent to be in the upper room for the nativity? I mean, that, 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 that thought crossed my mind as I heard you talk about it. Tell me about uh, what you've written. Yeah, so let's let's look at that. So in the book, I use all my own Bible translations. I translate from the Hebrew and Greek myself because I think so many of the English translations we have are misleading, especially when it comes to the translation of the gospel accounts of the Christmas story of Jesus's birth. So in the story of Luke's gospel, we read that Jesus was laid in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now that translation conjures up an image, right, of a hotel. There was no room at the end. There's like a no vacancy sign in Hotel Bethlehem, right? And the sense that people get is there's no room. So there's like an innkeeper and he's saying, okay, room three, uh, that's occupied. Room seven, occupied. Room 11, occupied. Oh, there's no room in the inn. That's not what's going on there in the story. So the word that's translated in, it's not the word that means in in Greek. Actually, Luke has a word that means in. We encounter it in the story of the Good Samaritan, right? The man is left for dead, beaten by the side of the road. Good Samaritan comes. He takes him to an inn. The Greek word there is pandokian. And he leaves him there with the innkeeper and he says, you know, I'll come back to town later and I'll cover his expenses. Okay, that's not the word that occurs in the story of Jesus' birth. It says that he was laid in a manger. The Greek word there is fatne. Manger is fatne. Most likely means like a feeding trough, as scholars like Raymond Brown show. A place where you put the hay or the, you know, the feed for the animals. And, and they, they put him in the manger because there was no space for them. That's how I translate it. There was no space for them in the kataluma. That's the word there that's translated in. Really, kataluma is the word that means room. There was no space, tapas, there was no space for them in the room. Now, that's a really significant word. People get frustrated when I say these things. They say, well, Dr. Barber, you're just myth busting. I'm not interested in just myth busting. People sometimes get upset with you know, Bible study, and they say, oh, historical criticism is worthless, and it's just meant to destroy people's faith. No. First of all, we should be interested in truth, and we need to follow that truth wherever it leads, okay? But here's the thing. If you miss this, you're going to miss a key element of the story that will really enrich your faith. So the word that's translated in is really room, and it's the same word that appears later in Luke's gospel. When Jesus tells the disciples to go into Jerusalem and prepare the place for the Last Supper. And where do they go? They go to the upper 
room. Jesus says, you'll find a room prepared. That's the same word that's found in the story of Jesus' birth. So let's recap. Jesus is put in the manger. He's put where the food goes because there's no space in the room. He can't be in the room, so he's in the manger. Later on, he goes into the room, the upper room, and there he says what? He takes the bread. He blesses it. He breaks it. And he says, this is my body. In the upper room, Jesus reveals what the story of his being laid in the manger points to, mm -hmm. that he's our food. And like I said, Jerome points out, this is hugely significant. Jesus is born in the house of bread. He's born in Beth, house in Hebrew, Lechem, bread in Hebrew. He's born in the house of bread to point forward to the way in the upper room, he will give us himself as our food. And that really is why I think it's significant. We call it Christmas. What is Christmas? It's made up of two words, Christ and mass. People say it can't be that simple. It's that simple. I'm telling you, it's that simple. <laughs> Goes back to Middle English, 1100s to the 1500s, basically. And, and this word Christmas comes from Christ and mass. And mass is a word that's used in England even today in the Anglican Church. They will celebrate even today, Michaelmas. What's Michaelmas? It's the mass for the Feast of St. Michael. It's the Feast of St. Michael or Candlemas. Candlemas is the old term for the Feast of the Presentation of the Child Jesus. Right in the story, Simeon says to Mary and Joseph that this is the light that, you know, the light that will dawn for all nations to see. And so since Christ is identified as the light of the nations, there was a, a custom that the faithful would be given candles on this feast day. So they called it Candlemas, the mass of the candle, right? So we call it Christmas. And it's really interesting, right? People always talk about, don't take Christ out of Christmas. Don't take Christ out of Christmas. We have a Protestant friend who's a, a biblical scholar. And a few years ago, just to be a fly in the ointment, he, he wrote on his Facebook page to people, he said, you know, it's always interesting. My Protestant friends are so interested in making sure we don't take Christ out of Christmas. They never talk about the danger of taking the mass out of Christmas, right? right? Yeah. That's dead on. Yeah. That is dead on. Right, We should keep Mass at Christmas because in the Mass, the same mystery that we remember, that is, the Son of God comes to us and is put where the food goes in the manger, that same mystery is now made present. That one who has made our food comes to us. And so every Christmas, every Mass, I should say, is a little Christmas. That's interesting that's really thing you note there, Dr. Barber, because I was thinking of, while you are saying that, of the fact that the anti-Christmas movement really started with the Protestant Revolution, with uh, the Puritans in America uh, pushing for this anti-Christmas position because it was a Catholic holiday, and they were actually like, it they didn't start that. in America. So let's be clear: it starts in England first, right? But it does get picked up in America as well because it's English colonies, and it's a major political issue. And I, I explain some of this in the book, but suffice it to say. After the Protestant Reformation, there's an understanding we follow the Bible alone. And if the Bible doesn't tell us when Jesus is born, and it doesn't tell us when Jesus was born, doesn't give us the date. Some people want to say, well, we can figure out when Zechariah was serving in the temple, and we can extrapolate, and we can figure out Jesus is born in the winter. I explain in the book, that doesn't work. Ancient Jews uh, didn't have leap days and leap years like we have today. It got really complicated. They would add a 13th month to the year every now and then. It was really complicated. So yeah, you can't you can't try to figure these things out like people make it out to be. They, people who say that don't know what they're talking about. But, but the Protestants would say is, well, we don't know when Jesus was born. And so therefore, since it's not said in the Bible, it's December 25th, we shouldn't celebrate Christmas. So they would shut their doors on Christmas Day, right? And it was even illegal in England and in America in certain times to celebrate Christmas. It was amazing. And, and what ends up happening is 
by the 19th century, people are still celebrating Christmas. They're just doing it not in church, but in the streets. And they're getting drunk. And they're banging on people's door. And they're basically assaulting people in their houses and demanding that they get gifts. That's what Wasseling was about. It's got a dark past. <laughs> you can read all about this in my book. And what ends up happening is these Protestant well-to-do basically wealthy people in New York in the 1800s say, you know, um, this isn't really what we want to do. And so this guy named John Pintard, he's a key player. He decides that, you know, we really need to rethink the way we're, we're celebrating this season. And he promotes of all things, a saint. He promotes at the historic, the annual meeting of the New York historical society. He promotes St. Nicholas. And he has this huge image of St. Nicholas displayed. And everybody in New York who's like in this, you know, the wealthy class, all of his friends, they all start thinking, yeah, you know, Nicholas is great because he shows us how we should give and we should be like Christ and be generous with the poor. And before you know it, people like Washington Irving, the great American novelist who was close friends with John Pintard starts talking about St. Nicholas a lot. And before you know it, St. Nicholas becomes a prominent part of the Christmas celebration. Mm. And all you know, all of a sudden we have Santa Claus. Santa means saint. Claus from Nicholas, right? And the whole idea is what? Nicholas is remembered for giving to the poor anonymously in secret. And that's what Christ taught us. Amen. Christ taught us when you give alms to the poor, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing, but your father who sees in secret will reward you. And so it comes to be understood to give in a Christ-like way is to be a secret Santa. Amen. Already in the 1100s, nuns, French nuns, are leaving gifts for poor children and signing them St. Nicholas. Hmm. Not because they want to like, you know, be duplicitous, but it's understood that we're not going to say who gave these gifts. So we're going to give under the auspices of St. Nicholas, because he's an example of giving in a Christ-like way. Amen. And this is how St. Nicholas becomes prominent as part of the Christmas celebration. And before you know it, everybody wants to go to church, even in America, and those Protestant ch church doors open up again, and people start celebrating Christmas in church. It's a beautiful story. Praise be to Hopefully God. Hopefully read about it in my book. Well, we are out of time, and the book is called The True Meaning of Christmas, The Birth of Jesus, and the Origins of the Season, which you can find your copy at Ignatius.com for the Ignatius Press. That's Ignatius.com. Dr. Michael Barber, thank you for your time today. God love you. God bless you. And if I don't see you, Merry Christmas. God bless you, and Merry Christmas to you as well. May God bless you and your family.